So we've kind of looked at how we've gone from uh, from the the paper records um, through to uh, being able to access on the internet in in web enabled ways the the knowledge that was captured around some of the models for managing uh, oceanographic data um, as it's been collected. But now um, let's just take a step to one side and have a look at the, the basic concept of, of this semantic web of linked data and then linked open data. And we'll then go from, from there and we'll look at uh, examples for, for how we can use this in, in uh, ocean sciences with ocean science research data published within this framework and using uh, these techniques. So first of all, let's have a look at, at what is very familiar to us all, um, the, the World Wide Web and the web of documents. So, um, you know, many of us, when we, when we start, up, start up our web browsers, we will uh, end up on, begin with a, a Google page and we'll quite often then uh, do a search for something and maybe you're interested in um, the research data management course because, because you're attending it. And the index that Google maintains allows us to search and it gives us links from the search through to pages that we're interested in. And those pages that we're interested in, so say the uh, research data management course at Ocean Teacher, will provide links to other things that we're interested in. So uh, in this case, these are internal links in the page here that are, are telling us about the overview and the document and who's participating. But maybe we'd be interested in going back out and looking at the, the videos that have been collected from other ocean teacher courses. So there's, there's links there. And I think that kind of idea is, is familiar to all of us. So what, what makes up uh, a web document and, and how does the, the web really work? So well, the first thing is that every, um, every single page on the web has its own unique identifier. Um, when you type HTTP at the start of, uh, of an address, that's telling it to use a particular protocol to, to find that page. Um, and then the web address, that unique identifier, um, is a uniform resource locator, a URL, that um, identifies the page that you're going to look for. And it, it tells your browser um, something about how to find that page. And then when you look up that page and the browser um, finds it, it expects that something will, a document will arrive back that conforms to some web standards. And um, we use that hypertext markup language, HTML, as the standard for delivering web document and something standard happens to the web document when it arrives back at the browser. So it's rendered so that you can, you can read it and you can uh, look at all the logos and the, and the colors that have been decided for the website and the text is displayed in, in a particular way. And again, there are, are links provided from the page to, uh, to allow users to find other things that they may be interested in. And uh, often those are linked out to other sites that may be of interest. So, so these basic concepts of how the World Wide Web of Documents are, is, is built up, we will come back to shortly as we look at a web of data. So um, Tim Berners-Lee, who, who designed and developed the World Wide Web, when he, was, uh, when he was really promoting the web in the late 1990s, uh, he said that, that basically um, the standards that we have for the web and the World Wide Web itself makes every online document look like a huge book that you can index and you can go through and you can find specific things in. And then 
he proposed what we call the semantic web, which takes the data in the world and puts it online in the same way that the web documents are online and makes all the data look like one huge online database. So um, I apologize that this is a, a, a slightly complex diagram, but we'll take some of the, some of the standards here. So this is, these are all the standards that the World Wide Web uh, Consortium have published to do with semantic web and semantic web services. And we'll just uh, pick on a few of them and um, we'll see how they fit together. And um, then we can understand how the semantic web is built on these web technologies that we've already started to discuss. So the first is the, uh, is the identifiers, the, the uniform resource identifiers, which we've already discussed as the, the locators that the web browser uses to pick up uh, an address and a site. Um, and the semantic web relies on unique identification using URIs and URLs of each data piece, um, each piece of information. So our, our next um, point along the line is, is XML, which I, I hope a lot of you are familiar with already, and that's just a way of, of writing a standard document that's very structured, and it allows you to uh, put metadata and data together in, in a document that describes um, very accurately and very precisely how all those things are linked together. And then the next piece is the information model that the semantic web uses, uh, which is a thing called RDF, the Resource Description Framework. And uh, that's a little bit more complicated, so we'll, we'll take a few moments to try and understand uh, the, that information model. So uh, within RDF, there, is, there are only three concepts in the information model. Everything is built out of a subject and a predicate which links the subject to an object. So there is a simple example here, which uh, if you take this particular uh, you could, it's a book or a film, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, as your subject. Um, and it has, a, it has a creator, and the creator here is the predicate. And the object, the, the link from the, the, the book or the film to its creator, J.K. Rowling. Okay, so that's a very simple example of how, how this three-piece information model is built up. So just to reinforce that subject, the, the title of the, of the piece of work here, and it has a creator, and the name of the person who did the creating. Okay, and um, just one thing to note here, this little DC and the colon, that's just a um, shorthand that, you, that is used quite often to indicate that there's a, there's a full um, web address there and you can you can use the the dc colon there as a as a shortcut to the dublin core um metadata that's that's there okay so a slightly more complex example still in in the universe of harry potter so if we take the film harry potter and the half blood, blood prince we can say that that's the same thing as uh, the sixth movie in the Harry Potter franchise. And within films, it's portraying the character, which is identified here as Harry Potter. And we'll give Harry Potter a, a, a text label, the label Harry Potter. And so you, even though that's a more complicated uh, example, you can see that you start with a, um, a subject here and um, so the same as an object and portrays the object here, Harry Potter. And then in the next step in the information model, Harry Potter becomes, oops, excuse me. 
um, Harry Potter becomes the subject, and here's a predicate, and the object there is just a text string. So that's the, the, general, um, the general information model that's used in the semantic web and linked data. And then um, the next little building block here is um, RDFS, which is um, it's, just, it's just an extension to that model that gives some more useful predicates uh, and no more and no less than that really. And then the next uh, step here is uh, Sparkle, which is the query language that lets us take that uh, information model that's made out of uh, the triples and it lets us query it. So um, here, is a, here is a very simple query that's built out of Sparkle. And we will come back to some more uh, complex examples and some more relevant examples later on. But just to give you a, a flavor, here, here is a, a specific um, set of triples that, that have this address. And we're saying select these three things uh, and there's a name and a nickname, and you can you can build that that kind of query using the the triple model there, and uh, so the FOAF is a friend of a friend vocabulary that's often used to describe a person, and you can see it's the same kind of syntax that was being used to build up the information models earlier. Okay, and then uh, the final thing that you might come across as you uh, explore the, the semantic web and linked data is uh, the concept of, of ontologies, which is uh, ontology is a way um, that's used to, to create formal descriptions of knowledge in a domain. So um, what we have here is, uh, so those, those uh, kind of code lists that were published in the paper form that we're saying are, uh, we have a, a uh, we've measured a parameter of salinity, or we have a, a, a platform class of a, a research vessel. They kind of form either a catalog or a glossary in this in this form. And then, um, if you go a bit bit deeper in building things, you could say that a specific research vessel. So one of the Marine Institute's research vessels is the Celtic Explorer, and you could say informally that's a kind of um, research vessel. And then if you get a bit more complicated, you can say that, that the Celtic Explorer is uh, narrower than research vessel. But then when you start building um, more complex descriptions and more complex conceptual schema of, of your knowledge base, then this is where you get into uh, what's known as ontologies. Okay, so those, just to give you some examples to help you to understand understand that. This is um, the simplest ontology I can I can think of. This one also comes from the World Wide Web Consortium and it's used to describe provenance. So it's particularly uh, appropriate in, in our line of work where we um, might have a, a data set which would be an entity and it could be attributed to an agent who could be the uh, researcher who went out to see and collected it and they would do some activity to collect it. So that could be a monitoring program, it could be a research cruise, um, and that might be associated with a different agent, uh, maybe the principal scientist of the, of the cruise. So um, you can see that that's a very simple ontology, but it describes quite formally the relationships between uh, activities and things and uh, people or organizations uh, with just three classes and, and five relationships. And you can uh, build more and more complex uh, ontologies. So this is um, one that comes from a European Union project, uh, which is looking at integrating data across the whole of the, un the European Union and describing things that you can go out and observe in the environment that well, you might have an object of interest, like a, a, a specific species of uh, chemical or, or uh, fish. You might measure something like the length of the fish in, in centimeters or meters. Uh, you might do, um, it might be the, the 
um, length from uh, mouth to the end of the fin, uh, and maybe the average of, of a group, um, and maybe you do the measurement in the water or in the laboratory. And it's just a case of taking those concepts and breaking them down and describing them formally. And then this ocean data ontology that the uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution have worked on uh, just adds a whole new layer of complexity where they're talking about organizations involved in, in collecting ocean data, uh, awards and grants and co contracts, and data sets. Um, so you can see that you could you can build and build and build all these different layers of, of complexity. So that kind of describes the the state of the the semantic web uh, as it is. But if we if we come back to this the quote that we looked at earlier from uh, Tim Berners Lee, we can see that uh, that that he actually describes there the semantic web. And then came up with this idea later on of, of linked data. And uh, basically, he plugged the, the idea of linked data into his concept of publishing these formal descriptions of data online so that, uh, so that they were accessible to the semantic web. So um, we'll, we'll now look through those concepts. They're very tightly coupled together. So the semantic web and linked data kind of fill in very similar spaces and use the same same techniques and technologies and ideas. So the four rules that uh, Tim Berners-Lee applied to linked data, and uh, you will recognize here this is a lot of what we were talking about when we were talking about how a web page fits together. So first of all, you have a unique uniform identifier to identify something. Um, an example of, of that something might be um, a research vessel. It could be a unit of measure, or it could be um, uh, the, the property of the environment that you've gone out and observed and, and recorded. Um, you use a standard way of addressing those URIs, uh, and in the case of linked data, it's um, it uses the same HTTP protocol that you will recognize from, from web addresses so that people can go and look up those things on the web using linked data as, as the way of uh, getting them back. And when, uh, when somebody uses their browser or some other software to access that URI, you provide back some useful information um, about the things that has been identified, and you, you're going to use the standards. You're going to use RDF, and you're going to use Sparkle, um, because you've got structured data in a semantic web sense. And then finally, you're going to add links to other URIs so that people can discover more interesting things, and they can browse and navigate through those interesting things. Um, so as well as having uh, for rules, there are five stars to deal with the quality of linked data. And um, the first star uh, down on the bottom left of the stairs there um, is that you've just put your data online. And uh, it doesn't really matter what format you've done it in, it's there and it, it, it's online. To gain the second star, uh, it must be in some kind of machine-readable format. So the um, the reason why it's gone from PDF there to, to Excel is that PDF is very difficult for a computer to to read and and make some uh, understanding of. Whereas Excel, you can you can read and you can plot some graphs and you can do some knowledge analysis. To gain the third star, you you move away from proprietary formats. So uh, you move away from, from a, a format that's, that's essentially closed because it's uh, owned by a software company. And you try and use um, something like CSV in this example, a comma separated value file that is basically text. And, uh, and, and that makes it uh, the, the th th third star. And in the fourth star, you start adding in those URIs as identifiers. And then when you get right to the top right there, 
to gain the five stars, you, uh, you're adding those HTTP links to other linked data resources. So you're connecting your data with other data and you, you gain the fifth star of, of linked data. Now, I, this, is a, this, this diagram is not intended to be read, uh, but it shows the state of the linked data cloud uh, as it's known, the connections between all the different linked data resources that are known. And so uh, green is, uh, is all to do with publications, and uh, pink is to do with life sciences, orange here is to do with geographic resources, and uh, if you look that, that up online, you can uh, wander through and, and have a look at all the, the different things that are connected together. But um, in some work that, that I did at BODC and with uh, Woods Hole and with uh, Lamb and Doherty Earth Observatory, we began to create a, a smaller, more localized version of that, that cloud for uh, linked ocean data. And so um, all the orange resources here are, um, these, these indicate a kind of range of uh, vocabularies that describe things like uh, places or a general environmental concept or species um, in, in, a, in an RDF way. So these are proper five-star linked data semantic web resources. And then here we have some uh, non-RDF vocabulary resources which are really useful and interesting. And then here we have some data sources that are RDF, and they're, they're publishing either their metadata or their data in RDF, and, but they're connected back to the NERC vocabulary server. And then some other data sources that are lower down that linked data scale. So the NERC vocabulary server publishes uh, terms. Uh, it, it's got a best part of 100,000 terms on there that are all to do with various aspects of uh, measuring the environment from, uh, th this is a geographic definition for um, nations that are bordering the Celtic seas. So England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, um, and, and it goes down to uh, things like individual research vessels, individual environmental parameters that, that can be measured. Okay, um, another resource that does a similar job is the Marine Metadata Interoperability Ontology Registry and Repository, and they register all sorts of different resources on there. Uh, here you can see there's a, a science vocabulary that's available, and so uh, there's connections between the NERC vocabulary server and the MMI resource there. Uh, the, there is a heritage data vocabulary for uh, connecting marine archaeology and marine heritage uh, resources to the oceanographic resources, particularly because there's uh, lots of detail about different vessel types. Um, and so we can link active vessels with, with uh, records about vessels that are no longer active. Um, we can describe uh, places using um, these resources. Uh, so the GeoNames resource has lots of really detailed information about geometries of different um, seas and, and towns and countries. Uh, it's improved quite a lot since we first tried to use it. So one of the problems that we had initially when we were trying to link the descriptions of seas on the NERC vocabulary server to geonames was that there were things like three Caribbean seas. Uh, and that made the linking very difficult because you didn't know which one to choose to, to link into. But here you can see that there's, now there's only one and it's sort of really detailed uh, outline of, of what the Caribbean Sea is. Um, in Europe, we, we have um, a research vessel database that, that just publishes everything in, in plain web pages, but each one of those web pages has a unique identifier, and so we can link um, 
the ship codes, which come from the International Council of the Exploration of the Seas, to these uh, more detailed descriptions of, of the vessels, including things like the, the um, instruments that can be deployed from the vessel and who to contact if you want to charter the vessel um, or if you want to use it for, a, say, an Argo float deployment or something like that. Uh, the World Register of Marine Species gives us uh, taxonomic details of every single uh, marine species that has ever been described in the literature, and you can you can link to each of those. So that's a really interesting resource. Um, some some projects that are publishing their data uh, in using these resources, so SeaDataNet, and uh, that's again a European project, and um, you can see that the parameter, the parameter groups here, so things like uh, carbonate system, that comes from the NERC vocabulary server. So it's linking back into that, connecting together. Um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and their uh, Biological and Chemical Oceanographic Data Management Office, they're using these vocabulary terms to drive their discovery website so you can discover based on uh, vocabularies to do with parameter categories and instruments uh, and people and projects. Um, the Rolling Deck to Repository program in the US that describes all of the, um, it looks after the, da the data from the cruises of all of the academic fleet in the United States. Uh, and they're publishing uh, all of that data online, including here you can see the cruise track. Um, as a linked data resource. Okay, and then uh, and then my favourite one, um, you, the British Broadcasting Corporation uh, does uh, lots and lots of natural natural history programmes. So, Blue Planet was one of their flagship series where they uh, spent eight eight episodes of around an hour exploring different aspects of uh, the ocean uh, and the seas. But the BBC publishes every single resource on its website using RDF, so uh, everything is linked data on there. And we actually connected some of the NERC vocabulary server terms to some of the descriptive terms that the BBC were using to, to describe their programs. So you can go from a data set to discovering uh, a media resource do with that data set. Okay, so uh, when you're publishing, I, sorry about the XML here, but when you're publishing linked data, you can either you can either do a couple of things. So you can put um, something like that online that looks like uh, XML and is totally unreadable to humans, and then you can do a little trick in your web servers. So if a computer program is asking for the RDF description, it gives them the XML. And if it's a, a web browser asking for a human readable page, it gives you the website. Um, and you can do, you can publish online in various formats. So the XML format is fairly common, but there's also lighter weight formats using JavaScript object notation that you can publish in as well. Or you can actually just embed everything into um, your web page. So there's ways of structuring the the content of a page. So this. Um, comes from BODC's published data library. And if you drill into the code of that page, you'll find that all of the, uh, all of the fields here to do with the, uh, the title and the authors, um, they're all available as linked data inside that web page. Um, and in fact, that's the, the definition there, but it's very small to see on the screen, sorry. So what can we do with linked data? Um, as, as research data managers. So um, one of the things we can do is if we, have, um, if we have a Sparkle interface for querying our linked data, we can, we can build queries. This particular one is for um, going through the um, climate and forecast metadata standard names, looking for concentration of nickel and weight of sediment and standard sediment. So you can filter on all sorts of different things within your, your labels. So that's quite a useful tool there, which you can do in, in normal data as well, but you know your structure doing it. 
um, and here in the uh, in the in um, a different vocabulary from the note vocabulary server is the result of doing that query. So it finds the one thing you're looking for. But one of the useful tools here with the Sparkle query is that I can add in an extra service. So if I run this query against the NERC vocabulary server Sparkle endpoint from the British Oceanographic Data Center, this is also going to go away and query the rolling depth to repository service um, from Lament Docker to Earth Observatory. So we can, we can actually ask questions of two separate databases in the same query. And um, we've shown ways, demonstrated ways of being able to connect actually three together before the query starts to really slow down. So um, one useful question for uh, the Biological and Chemical Oceanographic Data Management Office who are interested in, in um, specific measurements from the rolling deck to repository program is to say, well, the NERC vocabulary server knows what a CTD is, a conductivity, temperature, and depth sensor. Tell me about all the vessels in R2R that have um, an instrument of CTD. And then this is the uh, Bico Demo description of instrument here as well. So we can actually connect all three resources together in one single query. Uh, and then another useful thing that we can do um, is we can connect <coughs> we connect, can connect publications and methodologies. So I showed from the um, British Oceanographic Data Center's published data library embedding the structured metadata um, into uh, into one uh, of the the web pages there now. Those web pages are accessible via a DOI, a digital object identifier, and, and they're published using the Ocean Data Publication Cookbook. And uh, one of the useful things then is that the DOI is the is the unique resource identifier that that URI for the landing page, and because we're publishing the landing because the landing page is in the Ocean Data Publication Cookbook recommend having structured metadata, we can actually then use the ideas of linked data to connect um, from the page in which the data are published and the description of the data are published to other things like papers that are citing the data, to descriptions of the methodology that was used to collect the data, and to uh, other data sets that are related to the data. And then, um, kind of finally, on, on linked data, um, going back to the BBC here, one of the things that so we we did the link from the vocabulary server through to the British Broadcasting Corporation's programs, which gave us the, a way of working from a data set through to a media broadcast. But one thing that I would love to see one day is the ability to go from this web page here, describing the broadcast, and saying, if you're interested in exploring observations and real data that, um, that are of the type that were described in this program, observations to do with the coast, click here. And we could do that by inverting the mapping that we'd done um, earlier, and yeah, it's just something I would really like to be able to do one day. So for the last uh, last few minutes of of, of this uh, lecture, what, one thing I want to do, um, I just want to talk around um, some of the other emergent technologies that we're we're looking at, and how and, and maybe linking them to the semantic web and linked data as well. So going back to um, John Delaney's TED presentation and kind of thinking around what are the other um, emerging technologies around computer science uh, and um, uh, programming and things that, that, we, that are really uh, prevalent at the moment. And one of the areas that you'll hear more and more about is, is big data. 